In this video, we'll begin discussing our third quantum mechanical model system, which is called the rigid rotor. So the rigid rotor, as the name suggests, is going to be a model for how molecules rotate. So we've got several things here. We've got two atoms. They're connected by some covalent bond. The bond length is what I'm going to refer to as L, and that's going to be some constant distance. That's the rigid part. And it, this bond is going to be rotating. This diatomic molecule will be rotating around whatever center of mass it has. And that is the rotor part. So some factors to be aware of here. Um, so we have atom 1 weighs m1. The mass of atom 2 is m2. Each of them has a velocity vector, which is perpendicular to their uh, radius from one another, v1 and v2. Whichever one is further away from the center of mass is going to be traveling faster with a higher velocity. And the distance that they each travel is based off of their distance from the center of mass, L1 and L2. And they're just going to keep traveling in perfect circles as that constant bond length holds as the rotation continues. Okay, so what is the kinetic energy of this system? So the kinetic energy T is equal to 1 half mass 1 times velocity 1 squared, kinetic energy of atom 1, plus 1 half mass 2 times velocity 2 squared, kinetic energy of atom 2. Another quantity we can introduce is nu, the frequency of rotation. So nu here is going to be the frequency that we're rotating around um, this center of mass. How many rotations do we do per second? So that would be in units of 1 over seconds, or hertz for frequency. We have omega, which is angular velocity, just as we saw with the harmonic oscillator. There's an angular velocity here as well. That's 2 pi times the frequency of rotation. So v is equal to, the velocity is the length around the circle times the number of times we go around the circle per second. So the length of the circle is its circumference, which is 2 pi L. And the times we go around per second is nu. So that's 2 pi L nu. So the velocity is equal to L times omega. So we can recast our kinetic energy in terms of the length here and omega. So we have kinetic energy equals 1 half mass 1 times length 1 times angular velocity squared plus one half mass two times length two squared times angular velocity squared. This is the same omega for each of them because they have different circles but they're going around at the same angular velocity. So we have kinetic energy equals one half angular velocity squared times mass one times length one squared plus mass two times length two squared. All right, and we can introduce a new quantity here. You'll notice if we introduce the reduced mass, which we looked at in the harmonic oscillator chapter, the reduced mass is mass 1 times mass 2 divided by mass 1 plus mass 2. So if we throw that in here, we can actually see that we can get this to be factored into the, into the form that the moment of inertia the moment of inertia is mass 1 times length 1 squared plus mass 2 times length 2 squared. But it's also equal to the reduced mass times the total length squared. So the moment of inertia is like our resistance to angular acceleration. It's the analog of mass for rotational motion. So we can actually avoid having the problem of having two separate particles with a different length and a different mass going around the center of mass, and we can replace that with the reduced mass and the entire bond length of this diatomic molecule. So now in angular terms, the kinetic energy in rotational motion is 1 half moment of inertia times angular velocity squared. And we also have a quantity called angular momentum. Angular momentum is the moment of inertia times angular velocity squared or sorry, just times angular velocity. This is the analog to linear momentum P, which was equal to mass times velocity. So in rotational motion, angular velocity is the moment of inertia times angular velocity. 
So the angular momentum is going to be very useful to us in this chapter because it's a lot more convenient to work with than linear velocity or linear momentum. So we can factor this in terms of angular momentum instead of moment of inertia and angular velocity. So kinetic energy equals one half moment of inertia times angular velocity squared, which equals one half uh, moment of inertia squared angular velocity squared divided by moment of inertia. So I've added another, I've multiplied the top and bottom by I here. And L equals IW, this is I squared W squared. So this is also equal to one half angular momentum squared over moment of inertia. Just as linear kinetic energy and linear motion is one half momentum squared divided by mass. So this is going to be our model for the rigid rotor. Our kinetic energy operator is going to be the angular momentum operator squared divided by two times the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia, we'll remind ourselves, is the reduced mass times the bond length. And we'll get our operator for angular momentum in the next video. Our potential energy is once again going to be zero at all locations. The only caveat is that the bond length is fixed. So this diatomic molecule is free to rotate in this plane. It's free to rotate uh, out of the plane and back into it. It can do any kind of motion as long as the center of mass stays in place and the bond length is constant. There we'll get our model for the rotations of diatomic molecules and be able to get their energy levels, their spectra, and know all about uh, what happens when a mo molecule rotates in quantum mechanics.